Hello and welcome to the Pinnacle Podcast, brought to you by Pinnacle.com, the online bookmaker that offers you low margins, high limits, and a unique winner's welcome policy. Today we have a very special episode. Our guest is someone who is synonymous with Pinnacle and what it is to be a true bookmaker. It's our very own trading director, Marco Bloom. Hello, Marco. Hey, hey, Ben. Thanks for having me again. Been a while. No, thank you for coming on. I think it's your second visit to the the Pinnacle podcast studio. Um, What I'll do before we begin is I'll just kind of explain a little bit about what we're going to do today because we've we've got a few different series on the Pinnacle co- podcast. We we cover a range of different sports, but this one is is usually an interview type format where I chat to different people within the betting industry. Today is a, a little bit different because as we did before when you were on, this will be this will be an AMA or an Ask Me Anything. Um, as you know, we've been sourcing questions over Twitter for the last twenty four hours. You've agreed to go into this blindly, so you don't know any of the questions that are coming. I'm going to ask all the questions that we that we got that came in. Um, are you ready to go? Now let's see how nasty the the, <laughs> the Twitterverse has been with me. Cool. So what I've done is I've I've gone through the questions. I've kind of divided them up. Um, we've got a section that's that's focused on pinnacle traders or, or betters a bit as well. There's a bit on the pinnacle model, and we've got some specific sport or market questions. And then stuff that kind of touches on modern betting or, or the future of betting. So if you're ready to go, we'll jump straight into the first section, which is betters and traders. Let's do it. Cool. So we've got at Proyal Panash, and he says, what is the best yield you think a punter can achieve on the long term on your markets? Oh, I've been asked this question many times. It really depends what markets. Um some markets are small in size, so the liquidity is low. You can you can have a high margin. I would guess your your decent decent average range for professional could be around five percent, maybe. You know, five percent is probably really good already. But if you target a niche market, a very small market, I, can, I think you can achieve more. And if you're really betting broad into, into every single soccer market, for example, I think the margin would go down a little bit. And do you kind of, would you say you, like a, a Premier League soccer market, for example, would you respect someone more maybe if their yield was a little bit lower, saying that the 2 3% versus someone that might be in table tennis markets or some niche market with a, with a slightly higher yield? I, I guess it's harder to do, but I mean, I have respect for everybody who who puts work into a model and, and is able to beat a market. I mean, beating a market is, is not an easy thing. There's a lot of people in this market, and uh, any model that can outperform the market is, you know, res- gets my respect. Well, surprisingly, that was actually one of the few ones that, that focused on, on betters. Unsurprisingly, I guess, is people want to know about pinnacle traders, the peel behind the curtain if you like at pinnacle and our, our next question is from at a lucky day and he says hypothetically could your traders use the private information pinnacle has for example betting data or, or who placed those bets to make a long-term profit by making selective bets at pinnacle closing prices um that's actually a pretty complicated question that would indicate that our closing line is not as efficient as possible because to be profitable against the closing line as a, as a trader means you have, would have information that you didn't price in probably. Um, I think on I think my answer would be almost always no. Obviously there's exceptions to every, to every answer, but I don't think you could just bet as a trader into our closing line by the proprietary information that we have through our wages and make a profit. I don't think that's a possibility. And is there is there kind of a betting culture amongst traders at Pinnacle? Are they interested in in betting themselves, or does it kind of take away from the the allure, if you will, if you're trading the markets? I, I don't think many traders are actually active betters. I mean, partially because they can't bet with Pinnacle themselves, and uh, it's very hard to bet with any other sports book given the margins that other sports book run. You feel almost cheated. So I don't think anybody any trader really went in, in, into the betting. There are a few exceptions, as always. I mean. We, we, 20 years around and I'm sure a few of a few of the traders have been punters or punt on the side but there's not a big betting culture in, in you know in, among the traders so now we've got XE Eric 1975 and he says how do you know when a trader gets it well if I know the answer I would I would uh, I would be a lucky man trading is is is, is an art form right at the end of the day it's, it's a mixture between mathematics 
Sports Knowledge, Model Knowledge, Gaming Theory, Gamble Theories and apply it on a, on a, on a quick scale, fast-paced environment. So it's hard. I mean, it takes everybody a long time to actually get fully ready. I think if, if you can trade effectively before one year, two years, you know, you, you really got it fast. There are some natural people who, who, who are gifted. I was definitely not one of them. It took me a long time to actually understand how trading works, and I'm, I have been working in gambling or gaming my entire life. But, you know, trading is, is, is a tough environment. There's a lot of smart bettors on the other side, and they would they would like nothing more than to take your lunch money from you. And if, so from a, if you're looking at a pinnacle trader, do you, do you like it when those guys take risks? Is there kind of a format that you follow maybe to play it safe when you're starting out? What are you, what kind of attributes or what are you looking for in a, in a trader where they're one, two weeks, a, a month in the office? I like traders who stay out of trouble. <laughs> so quite the opposite. Uh, it's very easy to get in trouble. Uh, risk taking is, 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 is an interesting thing. It's, it's very easy to take risk. You know, there's a, you know, but there's no glory in risk, right? Because risk usually means you did something not quite correctly. Trading is all about being in control about the situation. And a good analogy is, you know, since most people probably know poker, if you think about poker and, and you know, you, you ask somebody, uh, given the situation on the river, what would you suggest? My answer would often be, well, I wouldn't be in that situation. I would have raced before, I would have folded before, I would have done something different. Now, basically, you're you're in a very poor position and there's no real good play getting out of it. And that's true for traders as well. If, if, if you trade yourself into a miserable position, you're probably done for, the, done for this game. So would you say it's kind of you don't want traders to have too much experience of that, but then at Pinnacle, do they need to, I'm assuming they need to be able to, to get out of that position? It's better to not get into the position. <laughs> That's actually the, the truth of it. And it's true. The market is very, very effective and very smart. And, and no matter how smart a trader thinks he is, usually the market just out trumps him. So we really have to be careful not, not to get caught up in our own ideas and our own world. Markets are very powerful tools and, and have to be respected. And is there any horror stories from your early days as a trader where you got your fingers burnt or you, you found yourself in that position? Horror stories from my career? Yes, I almost got fired uh, <laughs> two weeks into the job because I, I moved lines the wrong way. I think I better bet the over and I actually didn't quite understand how, how lines move. And, and every line, the better got a better line. Yeah, after, after every wager, you know, the better must have thought this, this is candy land. Yeah. I think he bet over, I think it was soccer, I think he bet over two and a half. Next wager was over two and a quarter. Next wager was over two. <laughs> I wonder if, if he, I wonder what he thought on the other side. You know, how low does this guy want to go? Yeah, it's an interesting, uh, interesting world. But yeah, I didn't really understand how, how markets move. I mean, I understood the concept, but I just, you know, in my mind, like I had, I had, I had a wire crossed, right? I thought, oh, he's betting over, so I need to make the price lower. You know, quite silly from now, but, but that was the reality. But, but I have had many horror stories with, uh, with trading accidents over the years, many, many of them. Well, just if we kind of go back to, to Eric's original question, it was very generalized about a trader. Then from, from your experience outside of the, the horror stories, was there a, a moment or a day of trading where you kind of felt like, finally, I've got it? Or is it really like a long, drawn-out process for you specifically? It was a long, drawn-out process for me. I mean, it is it is a little bit like the scene in The Matrix when you finally see see the, see the Matrix. You know, that's how you feel. You see the numbers, and it all makes sense. You, you, you basically see the entire story. You understand why are they betting, why is the market moving, what are you supposed to do. You understand everything. And even new information that constantly comes at you in forms of wages just adds to, to, to a story. But, but it's, a, it's a cohesive story. It's not, it's not a story that, that has cliffhangers in between where you don't know how to reconcile A and B. And, you know, there is this moment in trading where you're just in the zone and you just ride the waves and hope, hope, hope you get lucky at the end of the day. And once you're... There are more questions that come, so I'm just quite intrigued by this myself. Once you're, you're at that point in the matrix where the numbers reveal themselves and stuff like that, what is it that makes you become better as a trader is it just experience you have that that natural skill set or that nat natural affinity for the job and then you get there with experience you get better or can you can you read resources can you like better yourselves and learn more to become a better trader it's hard i mean you have to understand the sport that you're trading quite well at one point and not necessarily the sport from a sport level but from a trading level how does this sport behave so for example it's very common known that in soccer lineups have a major input on the on, on the lines 
So if you're a beginner and you don't know this, you, know, you might be trading all day and then suddenly one hour before kickoff, the markets go absolutely crazy on you and you have no idea why this actually is happening. But you know, if you're experienced, you understand, okay, one hour before kickoff, you know, lineups come out. So this means you're already on, on the lookout for the lineups you, yourself, but you're also very alert to wagers. And you see, okay, maybe this guy has information now. So re you react differently to wagers at a different time in the day. And, you know, certain kind of bettors might, might have a tendency to always bet in the afternoon or always bet in the evenings. And, you know, and, and so you really try to understand the sport that you're trading at, at a very granular level. That kind of feeds into to obviously from a, a betting perspective, often people talk about like the green lumber fallacy and the fact that the sporting no knowledge isn't necessarily a, a prerequisite to success in betting on that sport. Is it sporting knowledge? Is that important to, to trading those sports or do you have traders that trade soccer all day long and they don't know how it works? Uh, I have traders who traded uh, soccer for uh, probably 10 years and who couldn't name you the top the top club in their league, I, w I would be guessing. But I have the other, I have the opposite too. I have traders who know the sport inside and out, who can tell you the substitute player of, of a third league team. So I have both. Um, to become one of the true all-time greats, I think sport knowledge is a very, very valuable tool in your belt. I have to say that. I've seen top traders utilizing this quite effectively. And it often has to do with a deep understanding about how certain actors on, on the field impact the lines and, and what betters will, will make out of certain actions. And you know they can really abstract quite well from the reality of, of, of what they see on the pitch to the betting markets. And when you trade only mechanically, this is something that you really don't know quite well. We've got uh, another question from at a lucky day next. And <laughs> this one did make me laugh. Is the rumor true that you test your new traders by giving them three bets with a soft book? If they don't get restricted after those three bets, you send them back to training. That rumor is not true. However, however, most of us traders would get banned in three or less bets at, at a soft book. I myself got banned in a few books just you know, when I was trying to, to play around a little bit. It's not very hard to get banned. I mean, soft books are not are not any, any any worse in some ways. They're just slow. You know, and we are very fast. You know, and, and if, if you always know that the market is moving, it's really not that hard to get banned. So, will as part of traders' training, will they have to go on the better side of things and, and interact with the sports book and, and bet on markets themselves? Um, at one point, we used to do this. We we used to give people internal accounts who were basically accounts that they can do uh, off the book betting with us internally. You know, profit loss didn't really matter in, 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 in any way, shape or form, but it gave him a good feeling on how hard it is to, to be winning, how, how tough it is to beat the closing line, how tough it is to predict market moves, and probably a little bit humidity as a trader to, to appreciate what betters do is to put actual money on the line while they were betting fake dollars and, and, and couldn't, couldn't, couldn't achieve anything. Right, so our next question says, I know a lot of your traders have a background in Magic the Gathering, what is it about Magic the Gathering that makes a good trader or a good pinnacle trader? Uh, Magic the Gathering, as, as many, many games out there, it's just you know, a great game that you need, that you need to understand uh, math a little bit, you need to have gaming theory, you need to understand strategy, you need to understand tactic. I wouldn't say that Magic is, is, is any, any better or any worse than many games. It just happens to be the environment that, that I grew up in. And so we had good context in, in that world. And, you know, and thus we have a lot of players, a lot of traders who come from their background. But you know, could have been backgammon, could have been chess, could have been poker, could have been board games. I mean, there's many, many smart people playing games out out, out in the world, and they all would be potentially great traders. I know yourself, you're you're still quite regular on the game scene. Is it is Magic the big one for you? Is there what are the other big games that you you play? No, I'm a I'm an avid Euro gamer now in terms and board games. Euro gamers are basically people who like to push cubes of wooden cubes around that symbolize resources and and gets laughed at because there's no there's no atmosphere no no thematic uh, <laughs> vision in this in, in this board we might as well play with gravel in in the street you know but for us it, it makes all sense because we're building beautiful engines that are working wonderfully and putting out exciting new more cubes Right, so our next section is, it focuses on the, the pinnacle model. And first up we have at one big absurd. And he says, do you think pinnacle's business model will survive the next 10 years? Yeah, we made it 20. Yeah, I might as well have made another 10. 
I think there's always room for for somebody who's who's able to take a wager. I I think I've always been very outspoken that I don't think bad or worse about other business models. I respect other business models for being other business models. As Pinnacle's business model is working quite well. You know, we're around for over 20 years now. You know, I don't think we're going to go anywhere. I I I have plans to to make this a success in the in the future. You know, and and continue to offer good value to 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 betters. And well, I assume part of your job is is looking to ahead to potential things to develop or, or maybe even potential threats. So what what do you see as as a potential threat to the the pinnacle business model in the in the not too distant future? Hmm. Well, threats. The betting world overall is 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 a tough environment. You know, most of the customers wouldn't know this, but you know, like there's regulations in, in markets, you know, the cost of doing business is going up. It's not necessarily a threat to the business model per se, it just would limit the market where Pinnacle can operate. But I don't think overall it has a, as big of an impact to, to the underlying business model as people might think. Okay, next we've got at one two expert and he says, does Pinnacle shade lines beyond the size of their margin in an attempt to increase profits by exploiting square customers? If yes, is that systematic or just when the conditions of the match present themselves? And he's given Mayweather versus McGregor as an example. Okay, so lots to unpack there. So, so basically, if I think I have to rephrase this question is, are we dealing a line that we know is not efficient? Yeah, so <laughs> let's start with a few assumptions here. I mean, we don't know if a line is efficient or not. We have assumptions ourselves. So do we have assumption that the line might not be efficient? Yes, of course. I mean, that we're humans after all, right? And we think maybe we know things a little bit better. Um, the good thing is this is a, a market, and a market has two th- sides. So if we would be taken advantage of, quote-unquote, a square better by jacking the price up in one direction, there should be a sharp, quote-unquote, better taking the value on the other side and and. and catching our hand in the cookie jar and slapping the wrist right that's that's what should happen that, that's the theory behind an efficient market else the market is inefficient now markets are always inefficient and always efficient at the same time right that's the that's the dichotomy of markets you know if markets would be always efficient no one could have value you know at all however overall markets are you know, that means markets are inefficient at any particular second minute time interval but overall markets are very efficient we just don't know when, and we just don't know. We just don't know if all the information that is available is, is priced in already, or if the information will be coming into the market by wagers. Uh, Mayweather versus McGregor was an interesting fight, right? It's, it's it, I don't think it's a fight that uh, has an efficient line, right? It's a fight that has never happened in the history before, may not happen in the history again, between an ex world champion boxer against uh, an MMA fighter. You know, different weight classes, different age difference. Who knows, right? I mean, different sport. Different sport. It's just like it's it's not a real fight in some way. You know, if it wouldn't be for the marketing, you know, it would not have been a great event. But you know, the marketing was so fantastic that everybody has had an opinion. We don't know the answer to it. You know, like the greatest betting events in some ways are events like this, where it's a pure guessing game. No one knows anything. It's it's one thing to have models. You have historical value, and you start modeling, and you understand how how likely is it is in your team to win the first half, and and, and over under two point five goals, and all this stuff. This fight, there is no models. How do you model McGregor with this with, with this Mayweather? There is nothing you can do. It's just pure guessing. So our guess is as good as anybody else guess. You know that line drifted a lot during the day. You know we had a strong opinion. You know, but the betters also had a strong opinion. One of us won, one of us lost at the end of the day, but there's no sample size here. You know, this fight will never be repeated. You know, it's an interesting question. It's an interesting idea about how how betting works on the deep end. We are trying to to serve to 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 deal a line that that is efficient, given our risk appetite. Well, the the example he's provided there is obviously a very unique one. So if it was perhaps in the context of lines that are traditionally more efficient at pinnacle say like the the premier league or something does that does that happen in in premier league soccer so i mean the idea is like the market would be trading 2.05 or something 205 and we would be trading 210 i mean we would be instantly snapped 
you know, instantly snap. Now, maybe that's what we want. Maybe we like the other side for whatever reason. Sure, but I mean, it's, yeah, like everybody has a risk portfolio. You know, we as a company have one. Every better has one, right? I mean, Kelly is, is something we've discussed many times and other people have discussed on the podcast. You have to use some understanding that a bankroll is not unlimited, no matter how big your bankroll is. Right, so now we've got at Whale Kappa. In a given week, are all the games treated equally in terms of price identification or is there game-specific approach that reflects the expected volume, i.e. are standalone primetime games or rivalry games treated differently? Yeah, I mean, they're treated differently, not necessarily from us, but you know, if games have more turnover, it means you know, more people care about this, so... Uh, you know, you have a much more efficient line, once again, because you have a more liquid market, and so on. So it's not necessarily something that we control on our end. It's something that the market pro- provides to us. Obviously, we have expectation, right? If you know there's a primetime game or rivalry game, you know that people care about it, and you know more liquidity comes in, which means maybe you, you, you react differently to some wagers because one wager now, in the context of one game, is less meaningful than another. You know, but that's once again it's something that the market dictates to us. And a lot of these, I mean, we can use like the Super Bowl as, as an example. And a lot of the talk around that was sharp betters, quote unquote, would say, "Don't go near the Super Bowl because the line is is so efficient." It's from a bookmaker's perspective. Are these games where there's a lot of public money within them? Are they what everyone makes out to be? Are they that hard to be, or, or does it happen? I think there's a lot of hyperbole around this. The fact is, they're harder to model. I mean, Super Bowl not, because Super Bowl is just another continuation of a domestic uh, league, right? But if you talk about a World Cup, it gets tough, right? I mean, World Cup has big big money being bet on it, but how many times has Germany played Angola before? And even if, if they have, is it relevant to this day? Um, so I, I think there's a lot of hyperbole. I mean, sure, the, the markets are more efficient than a table tennis game. I'm not going to try to tell, say different about this, but I mean, you shouldn't be so afraid of this. There's still plenty of value to be gotten. And, you know, like the idea that, you know, there's a lot of square money around or public money, you know, there's probably also a lot of sharp money around and maybe maybe it doesn't balance each other out. Uh, we We tend to often stay out of conflict on these games and just try to ride the market a little bit and, and, and not get too caught up in our own opinions. Yeah, because I guess the the perception might be an event like the World Cup or these these big money events that we're sat there or Pinnacle sat there licking their lips thinking about all the money that comes in. But is it right to say that you're suggesting it's, it's actually more of a challenge than, than maybe people think from a, a bookmaker perspective? I mean, the World Cup was an especially hard event to trade. Very challenging to trade the World Cup. No... No history, no no prior games can help you to to get a little bit of a base feel. Like if somebody if somebody is a, a savvy, you know, Premier League better, and I would ask him to, to price up Liverpool with Manchester United, I think you get pretty much very close to the, to the closing line just by by initial gut feeling. You have seen these, them play a few times. You have a good understanding about the strength. If I ask you to price up a a World Cup game, especially a lopsided World Cup game. Let's say you know, one of the best teams against one of the worst teams. If this is a three-goal favorite, a four-goal favorite, a five-goal favorite, I don't think you have a good idea about this. And no model will really tell you this. You might have some basic Edo-like models, but really it doesn't help you very much. Right, so our next question is from at Adam Chernoff, and he says, how much does the pre-game closing line influence second-half odds in American sports, if at all? I would say quite a lot. If you think about it from a Bayesian perspective, that is the assumption about how this game will play out. Now, obviously, during the first half, you have additional information. And some of the information might completely invalid the prior information. For example, LeBron James was injured you know, in the first half. Obviously, the, pre- li- the pregame line didn't, didn't have this knowledge that he will be injured. And thus, it's probably invalid almost at this stage. But many games play out according to expectation. So I think there's a lot of value in the pregame line. However, you have to understand this. You know, you now have two quarters of additional information which have not been priced in, and and they are much more relevant than the prior assumption, right? That's what Bayesian updating would, would dictate to you. Right. So now we've got another one from at Perrier Panache, and he says, "What is the average distribution between data science and total money engaged when you set an odds when you set odds or a line, 80-20, 60-40? Probably 100 and zero. I, th- I think this is, this is almost like a, 
a romanticized version about sports betting works. You know, the bookmaker sits in his chamber and has this big book of of anything, and it's just think we put prices up. We price thousands and thousands of markets, thousands and thousands and thousands. We just want to put a good line up. You know, I mean, obviously we try to think what you know, in some games. What what would the market think about this game? You know, but to me, this is just data science, right? You know, this idea that I think this the question has is that we're going to take advantage of some inefficiency of opening line betters. In reality, the opening line betters are quite sharp, you know, because their models are quite efficient, you know, and, and you know they will attack our lines immediately. So you just put up the best guess that you have. And just on kind of data science stuff, I know you've spoken a bit about kind of R and Python and, and their importance to Pinnacle. How I don't say far ahead and far behind, but where do you pitch the the data the level of data science at somewhere like Pinnacle versus a a, a recreational bookmaker or, or whatever you want to call it? I, th- I think the recreational bookmakers data science will focus on different things. I think they do great data science when it comes to uh, bonus campaigns, you know, maybe advertisement, maybe even website optimization. I mean, there's some smart people working in every 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 company. You know, you you don't become an all-time great bookmaker. By, by having bad people working for you. It's just their focus is not necessarily on finding efficient odds. While well, we are very much focused on being an efficient bookmaker and providing you know great odds to our customers. So I, I don't think the other companies are lacking behind unintentionally. I think it's a very intentional decision by them to not focus on this. It's just not their main business. But now we've got another question from Atwell Kappa, and he says, how much does your approach to pricing change over the course of a season for a given sport as more data becomes available and ep- epistemic uncertainty gets smaller? Absolutely. I mean, you almost answered the question yourself. I mean, you're talking about a Bayesian progress here, right? We're talking with a prior, you know, and then you know, the prior gets updated every game, every 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 event, you know. So you know, over the course of the season, you know, the, the prior becomes less and less uh, relevant, and, and the updates become more and more relevant. And that's exactly what 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 uh, I forgot the name of of the Twitter user suggested. It is, and that, that's that's the reality. The first game of any of any domestic league is is, is a pure guessing. You know, but after the six, seventh, eight games, you know, you somewhere in the mid season, you know, every every team has played, you know, each other basically close to it. You get a good idea about the relative team strength. And this the idea of Bayes, and obviously it's it's very important to the mindset of like a, a trader as well as a better. How much of it uh, of people at Pinnacle is almost like a a natural. Uh, Bayesian approach rather than you obviously get people that, that study it in detail obviously with the maybe the the magic the gathering background and things like that is it kind of some people almost think like that without even knowing what it is or what it's called yeah probably if, if you work in gaming or gambling for a long time you you tend to think Bayesian per definition it's a very natural way of, of approaching any problem right you have a prior assumption now you see evidence one way or the other and, and you just have to constantly adapt your prior your prior knowledge about the situation. You know, new information has to be priced in. And this is true for markets or for life. Right? You know, you just have to understand if you if you meet a person and you don't like him at at, at the first meeting, you probably will not like him at the second meeting. But maybe you realized oh maybe maybe it was a little bit more pleasant than I thought. So ever so slowly you're gonna update your 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 bias. And with the this idea of kind of I guess like a, a natural approach versus like an actual a spreadsheet for example that people have spoken about kind of intuition and there's i think there's a, a story we've talked about in the office about a tennis coach who who knew when a double fault was coming purely because he's taught so many lessons and could almost um had that intuition of when it was coming do you respect that idea or is it just nonsense to you that's nonsense <laughs> Yeah, you know, the the hot hand fallacy. You know, like I, I can feel it. You know, I, absolute nonsense to me. Right. So whale capper again. Do you give special attention to identify betting angles or tendencies of limit betters who bet late in the market cycle? Yeah, partially, yes. Um, we give special attention to almost every betters who who who, who bet. Right. That, that's the reality. We are a betting shop after all. Um, limit betters, meaning people who bet the maximum. Um, at the end, yeah, I mean, it's interesting that they chose the end, right? I mean, why why did they choose the end? Is it because the limits are the highest? You know, because presumably Bayesian updating dictates that the price is more efficient than, than prior. So what what is what, what information are they pricing in now or releasing to the market now that they didn't release before? So for sure, we, we pay close attention to all of these betters. But, you know, every better needs, needs its own attention. You know, every better is dangerous. Can you... 
can you do you track the the life cycle of a better from those early stages of betting early in the market where they potentially might have the the bigger edge or the more value but they're they're not betting those high limits and you you see them kind of progress and they're they're happening to to forego that that edge just to get more money down as a bookmaker there's only so few knobs i have limits margin and availability in general let's assume we want to offer a game um, the uncertainty in an opening line is much higher than a closing line. So to protect us against that, um, to not be taken advantage of, of, of very informed bettors, the limits are usually smaller at the beginning and increase successively during the lifetime of an event. So the bettors themselves are in a prisoner dilemma situation. They understand that the opening line is not sufficient or not efficient, but the stakes are low. And they know the stakes are getting higher, but if they wait, they might lose out on a bet because somebody else is willing to place the, the wager for, for a lower amount. So it's an interesting dilemma that they face. How good is your information? How unique is your information? And when is the best time to bring it in? If your stake is $50, it's very easy. Bring it, bring it in as soon as you can. You have no problem with this. If you want to bet $1,000, well, maybe the same is true. But if you're big better, $10,000 and the opening line limit is, is $1,000, maybe you're not happy, right? Maybe you're, But can you risk it? Can you wait until later on to bring your bet in? Do you think other people have detected the same inefficiency in the line that you have? Can, will it be common knowledge at this stage? So these are the things that the bettors have to go through. On our end, we try to play the opposite games. We try to say, okay, our uncertainty at the early market is very high, so we need to protect us with lower limits, you know, maybe higher margin, and then move it up or down um, during the day when, when, when we have more certainty. What you will see is very typical in US sports when you have a so-called injury game where it's unclear if one of the stars can play this game, the limits will be much lower than any other game on this day. We still offer it, but it might be at 20%, 10% limits because there's high level of uncertainty. If um, LeBron James is playing or not, it's a big difference in odds. So we don't know, right? Because it's, it's, it's not a grading scale. You're in a binary situation. If he plays, it's X. If he doesn't play, it's Y. There's nothing in between. However, you have to trade one line, right? You, don't, you can't trade a dual line and one of the lines gets voided, you know, depending on, on, your, on him playing. So you have to be very, very, very conscious. At one point, you know it's clear that he will play or not. Somebody will know. And at that point, the line will flip into, in, into the, from this uncertainty into a certain situation. So you're in, in that example, per se, you're ready to go with both lines. And then it's just a case of as soon as you get that yes or no or the knowledge of the, the injury, you, you've hit the switch. and the Yeah, it's, I mean, it's Schrodinger's cat, right? I mean, that's what it is. We don't know what the outcome is. You know, we just know there will be an outcome. Is there an argument that perhaps in that situation might suggest that there is information within the market that you'd begin to find out as money comes in? So it's not necessarily traders have, have a line to, to the Lakers and when LeBron's going to play, but they use betters to, to gauge as more money comes in. It's at what point do you say, okay, now we know LeBron's probably going to play. And the market is, is very clearly... Uh, telegraphing the information. I mean, markets don't, don't work on altruism. Markets work on, on profits, right? And if somebody has an information like this, he knows the information will be publicly available any second, any minute. So the goal must be to, to get it into the market right now when the market is not fully aware of the information. You know, we always know that at one point we see the lineup. We see LeBron James on the court or we see him with crutches on, on the bench. And, and that moment is clear. So you have to get your money down before this. So we are we are on the receiving end of this. You know, we will see the wages come in, and at one point, it's very clear to us that one or the other is, has happened. And is there instances where that works against you, and you use that information, and and it's incorrect, or there's specific betters that that have a history of? Yeah, there's actually a one game I will never forget is a Champions League game where Messi didn't play, and you know, and. Uh, in the second half, all of a sudden, the, the line drifted, and we, we had no idea where it drifted. You know, we didn't we didn't necessarily had a good TV uh, signal. Uh, however, we, when we rewatched it, what actually happened is that Messi warmed up from the bench. He just warmed up, and then sat down again and never played. So for the short period, the line drifted, and then drifted right back. And I thought it was one of the funniest things. You know, Messi is so powerful. You know, he just has to warm up to move the line. Yeah. 
Right, so next question. Be- before I ask this one, I, I we said on Twitter I'm going to ask every question. We can't guarantee an answer to it, but st- stick to the guns. I mean, it's not bad. At one big absurd, what was Pinnacle's turnover last year? Yeah. <laughs> next. The, I get, the reason I'd like to ask that is, like, why do you think people are interested in in that kind of information like what do what do they gain out of it is, is it pinnacles on the ropes is it there's i don't know i think people are just fascinated by big numbers you know i mean that's the reality you know why do people care about the me in the forbes millionaire list what does it matter to me how much money where warren buffett has or bill gates has or who has more of these two it doesn't really affect my life in the slightest but for some reason it's very interesting to people Right, so our next section is sports and specific questions around those. And we've got one from Carlo Abelli, and he says, which were the weirdest market situation Marco had to address as trading director? Weirdest market situation? Oh, yeah, we had a good one at one point. I don't know. It must have been six, seven years ago. A, a soccer game ended in the, I think, 78th minute. Which is, you would say it's not unusual, maybe there was a riot. No, the, the, the referee just mis- misjudged the time. He just called it off. And this was a very interesting situation because the referee has the power to do this in soccer. The referee decides if a game has finished or not. And obviously like, obviously, it was very bad for the betters, right? If you bet over, I mean, you got cheated out of 12 minutes. I mean, it's, it's somewhat absurd, but we had to grade it according to the referee. And I thought it was a very wonky, wonky, uh, wonky way. In another game, in the same line, we had a soccer game being called off in the 92nd minute or 93rd minute, but not finished because the, the, the referee had problems, I think, with some fireworks in the stand and he called the game off. But for our purposes, it was not a final game because he didn't, he didn't say the game is finished. He just said, you know, we, we have to leave, uh, leave the pitch now. So we had to grade it as, as not played. How many? How often does that have to happen, or is it as soon as something like that happens, you then have to write that into the the grading rules, or is is the foundations there to to cover almost any outcome that that it's it's fine from a betting I mean, perspective? We're trying, right? I mean, our our rules are now so ex, so ex, you know they have so many additions over the years. You can't really cover every single situation. You try to find a rule which gets close to it, and then see how you can apply it. The problem is, the betters always feel cheated. No, I mean, I, I can't tell you the amount of times I have angry emails arguing for both both sides of a coin, right? Which is fair enough. I mean, there's money on the line. Everybody sees their side. Often uh, the, the sentiment is that we're trying to protect us, which is rather comical. You know, we are, we're just trying to find a fair decision, whatever it is. We have paid countless of times. We have paid both sides of the market. That's the reality. If, if our rules are not, not quite good enough to cover a situation, we just say, oh, whatever, we just pay both both sides. You know, that's the cost of doing business. You know, if your rules are not sufficient, you sometimes have to have to just bite into the apple and, and, and get it over with. And this one, I mean, he uses the word weirdest market situation. Is there, so that's kind of obviously a, a specific situation within a market. There's, is there a, a weird market like the, the Mayweather-McGregor? Is there anything else in recent memory that to you was just such a, a unique event that was difficult from a from a trading perspective, from a betting perspective, and it was just a, a free for all. Yeah, there are a few, a few. Mayweather, McGregor's was actually not nearly as uh, weird as Mayweather, Pacquiao. I thought that was an extreme, extreme split between East and West. You know, everybody in the East bet on uh, Pacquiao, and everybody on the West bet on uh, Mayweather. So you really saw a split book on on all of this. You know, luckily, you know, Pinnacle. You know, I was able to, to, to help out all the arbitragers in the world. So I think the arbitragers on that day had a heyday. You know, we're arbitraging, you know, one side against the other with us. You know, it was that was a great, great betting market for us. One of, one of the all-time greats. I always remember this one fondly. You know, so much action coming, coming left, right and center just because two east and west couldn't agree. And what is, if we say weird markets or, or unique markets, what is it that that has to get, Pinnacle involved. I know you reference like the marketing of the fight for the the McGregor Mayweather. Are we talking about the amount of money in the market? Is it has to reach a, a certain appetite for us to to get involved, or will we happily put up a line for something that could maybe open us up early on and and hopefully it forms itself? 
Yeah, I mean, there's a cost of doing business, right? I mean, you know, you know people have to get paid to, to put up lines, have to monitor this. You know, we have to make sure that we have rules to govern it. That's often a big problem, especially with no- novelty props. You know, do we have any rules that cover it? What happens in certain situation? Some of the props are not that easy to put up, you know, because, you know, let's think about the Super Bowl. I mean, every year there's a big discussion about the anthem. You know, how long is the anthem? What, what defines the length of the anthem? And, I mean, there's no official result. Right, so now you can come up with a complicated rule frameworks around the anthem, you know. But people will always find an argument why, why this and this was not part of the anthem, and yeah, it, it's a tough. You know, these novelty props are fun and they're interesting to bet, but they're really hard to grade. You know, in an in a official efficient manner. Right now we've got at DEC and a, a load of numbers. Um, EPL is efficient, but because of sharps plus lots of public joes. What market has the smallest split of sharps versus public at Pinnacle? I think there's a little bit of a misunderstanding. There are... The market size... The market is a pie. And you would assume that the difference between EPL and badminton league is not necessarily the distribution between sharps and squares sharps and joes or whatever the the question said is the size of the pie epl is just so much bigger that more sharps can fit into the tank and more joes can fit into the tank but the ratio doesn't necessarily have to be any different so now we've got a question that says everything seems to be about live betting now again what is the split of time spent developing live models against pre-game do you just build on pre-game into live or it's completely different uh, it's completely different. Pre-game is about price discovery. That's that's the fancy word, you know, because you have no idea what the line should be. Once you have life, you have a, you have a very good bias of you know prior what the life line should be. So it's all about how can you uh, price life effectively, given that events are happening in real time before you. Our next question actually touched upon one that we had earlier because it says. How do you calculate the odds for these recent YouTube celebrity boxing matches? Do you use any of your own data, research, or is it purely based on the market? It is based on us having a laugh and, and throwing a price up. That's the reality. I mean, these, these, these YouTube fights, you know, I mean, I probably, we probably you know, find them funny ourselves and read up a little bit. And then you, you you put up a price, you know. If sometimes there's a market price, sometimes there's a price that you disagree with, and, and you just have a laugh at it yourself. Is is there a culture that within Pinnacle, if per se someone's interested in in that celebrity boxing match, or or they come up and there's an internal discussion, and they say, you know what, I think I can do a good job of that. Do we then let that trader take it on, or does it? Yeah, is there I mean, a certain for sure. culture? I mean, one of the one of the stories that I remember is ah, oh, this must be eight years ago. Maybe uh, something around this. We uh, the head trade of the of the NBA, head trade of the US sports, and myself got together in early September and discussing the NBA. We were all NBA fans, you know. Miami Heat, you know, had had the dream team. You know, the first game was was announced, and we were like, well, let's throw up a line. You know, that's got to be fun. So we just got together. You know, handicapped ourselves, and I think we. Uh, I think they played against the Celtics. I don't really know anymore. But I remember the line was, I think, two, minus two and a half. So we put minus two and a half up, got a little action, and then nothing happens, which is exactly what we expected. The next day, I, I see a giant article being posted by a, by a writer basically arguing, uh, unknown to, to us, that you know we, we purposely moved the line to two and a half. You know, the line apparently was one at Vegas, you know, and we didn't know about this and now Vegas is trading two and a half. And he wrote an entire three-page article why the line should be two and a half, why we got it right and why Vegas got it wrong. <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself, well, we just guessed, you know. It, it, there's a lot to be read in the line, some, some, you know, but sometimes the line is just a line, you know. Well, I mean, people do often make a lot of that, and we we saw it in the NFL. We do an NFL podcast, and there's a lot of talk about contrasting Pinnacle's lines versus Vegas lines versus other bookmakers. How much of that do you really take note of? Is it is important to you, or are you concerned with, with what we're booking at Pinnacle and, and only what the Pinnacle line is? We are responsible for our own book. I'm not responsible to risk manage any other bookmaker. 
So the primary concern of every trader is to risk manage pinnacles wagers. So we need to be efficient in this. However, we are part of a market and obviously there's information priced into the market which is not peer to pinnacle in terms of wagers, right? We, we don't have 100% of all wagers. We have a decent amount, but you know, there's plenty of wagers being placed with other bookmakers that we don't understand. Now, a bookmaker is not equal to a bookmaker. We're talking about efficient bookmakers. Which bookmakers actually allow wagers to place wagers? You know, if it's a recreational bookmaker, probably the information better this bookmaker is not as relevant than another you know, efficient bookmaker. So it's a complex question. But I think in a nutshell, this entire talk about us, us and, and the Vegas line is, you, know, you, know, you, you can look and then trust any line you want. I mean, it doesn't really matter to me at the end of the day. You know, if, if, if the Vegas line is different than ours, then it's different than ours. Natural segue here, because I didn't actually read the next question, but it says, it's from Adam Chernoff again. Did anything stand out from a bookmaking perspective this NFL season, as many of the bigger moves, especially on totals, got killed this year? Was handle up or down in comparison to other seasons? NFL has always the problem of a very small sample size. You know, and every year there's there's so much reading into what happened. It's a very small sample size. You know, who knows if, if the moves were right or wrong. At number one, Angie, could you open your MBA lines earlier so a competitor or someone else in the industry can scrape it and open sooner? I guess the real question here is, why do we have to open some markets later than others? Is it information in the market? Is it confidence in our own lines or, or getting picked off in, in specific sports? The life cycle of a line is, is, is defined by, you know, by, by traders going through their routine. So, you know, let's take English Premier League as an example because it's a good one. You know, it's very easy to price up the next six weeks or whatever, or four weeks, you know, whatever schedule is available of English Premier Leagues question is why what's the point like why are we doing this you know you could do it as a customer service you could say oh well we got all the lines and this might be fine if you're a recreational bookmaker you know maybe maybe it's it's uh, but for us we're in a world where you know we have very 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 smart people betting and so our lines if i price something up four weeks in advance i i will have complete adverse selection meaning i will get zero bets if i price it correctly I will get a lot of bets if I price it incorrectly. And if I ever forget to move a line in the, in the, in the future market that has any information pricing that happened in the game, like an injury that happened on the pitch, I can almost count the seconds until I get a bet on the future market. From the TV picture, I can count down to three and I will get a, a bet on the future market. So what's the value for me to do in it? Who am I actually serving here? Which customer am I addressing? Is it actually that good for customers to bet three, four weeks in advance? Is it something they care about? My answer is usually they don't. You know, it's a lot of fluff around this. Well, I guess there's often a reason people might complain about lines not going up early enough. And some of them may well be value bettors or sharps that, that can pick off or, or have an edge. Some of it might just be people that, that want to see the lines up to get a bet down. Does that? Do you think there's a disparity perhaps between how betters understand the market and what the danger is to, to someone like Pinnacle putting up every line for the next six weeks in the Premier League? As a better, my incentive would be to get the lines as early as possible because I'm not obligated to place a wager. As a bookmaker, I'm on the other side. You know, like I cannot force anybody to wager. You know, I mean, countless of times, countless of times, we have gotten requests from customers of ours to open up lines. Countless of times. I would say with an 85% likelihood, if we open those lines, which we did many times, these customers have not placed a wager on these lines. So the only reason they're, they're asking, which is, which is their fair prerogative, is, hey, can you please misprice these markets? You know, I have a good idea what this, what this prices could be, but maybe you misprice them. So please price them for me. Now, oh no, you didn't misprice them. Okay, now I don't have to place a wager. And that's what we see with future markets as well. Future markets is, 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 is basically a test. Are you mispricing future markets? Yes or no? You know, and so there is not much value in, in, in doing this for us. Right, so now we've got, I think it's a, another one from at one big absurd. <laughs> Quite an absurd question. Or <laughs> How significant my stake would have to be to move odds on Premier League on Pinnacle? Let's say I'm betting on the day of the event. I don't know, give it a go. I mean, it's one of these weird questions. I mean, our limits are clearly displayed. 
So, you know, place a limit wager, you know, I'm sure we adjust a little bit. Place another one, I'm sure we adjust a little bit more. And now we've got at YJ Park. Do you allow and honour professional athletes betting on their own sport? How about betting on themselves to win their own match? In almost every sport, I think except boxing, it's illegal to to place a wager on on a match that you're involved in. In almost every sport, the leagues wouldn't allow you to wager on events in your league or in your sport. We are very careful about this because you're getting very close to insider trading, betting. So we would not allow this if we would get notified or, or, or find out that a player is, is actively involved in, in these kind of wagers. We would we would you know, we would close the account almost immediately. And now we've got another one from Adam Chernoff. And this one falls into a category of complaints, I guess. Is there a reason that college basketball games have gone from minus 120 a side or 1.83 at Pinnacle, where in years past Pinnacle had the best prices in the market? And we did we did have a similar question about uh, League of Legends as well. So I don't know if there's a, a generalized answer to, to that sort of question with regards to the margin or the odds that are posted. It's always a, it's always the, the same question, right? I mean, why did this could get worse? And I understand that it's frustrating from a better's point of view. From a better's point of view, you, know, you, you don't want your your product getting worse, you know. And it doesn't really matter why it gets worse, right? The fact that it gets it gets worse for you, and, and you're unhappy about this. From my, from my perspective, I'm trying to find a balance between offering great value to the clients by also being able to have a sustainable market that I can offer. There is no point in me offering a, a, a very tight market that, that I then have to take down because our risk our risk uh, exposure is exceeding the market. So you always have to understand a little bit, like what's my expected action? What's the market looking like? It's not a simple thing. It's not greed that motivates all of this. It, it's, yeah, we have to have a sustainable business behind all of this. Right, and now we've got a, a section that's kind of the modern betting or the, the future of betting, I've labelled it. Um, at pay the don T or at pay the don't. Now that the landscape of the US has changed dramatically since PASPA was repealed, what is gating Pinnacle's return? Uh, complicated question. Um, I, th- I think the, the fair answer is, you know, we're still investigating. We still haven't made a complete determination about how, if, when, where, what, you know, there's a lot of questions around it, but it is being heavily uh, thematized and then discussed. You know, it's a big topic for Pinnacle. You know, we just haven't made an official decision yet. I mean, it's a it's obviously a massive topic within the industry. It's been on recent podcasts as well. We've talked about it quite a lot, and the the gripes, shall we say, of of European customers that now U.S. betters are beginning to experience about restrictions, about kind of customers getting banned or not getting paid out. Do you think that, I often get asked this, I I often ask guests this as well, do you think that the US is going to trend towards that same direction or is there going to be something that will will stop them encountering the the European betting problem, if you will, for customers? It's tough to say, right? I mean, the general assumption has to be that it trends toward the European gambling mindset. You know, Europe is ahead when it comes to gambling legislation. However, you know, there is tendencies in the US market that that for example on this limiting of players and allowing a min bet goes the other way, which then could be a nice signal for Europe once again to say, well there is another way. We, you know, Europe has fallen into the strut. Well this is the way to do bookmaking. There's this one cookie cutter recipe and that's how things are done. Maybe the U.S. is stepping up and saying, no, I mean, we want to go back to the roots of bookmaking, where it is, you know, if you place a wager, you know, you can place a wager, and I can't just stake factor you down to to one euro, one dollar, and basically prohibiting you from placing a wager. Is it is it the customers that can do enough to, to make that stand, or is that something that has to come from within the industry or a collaboration between customers and, and bookmakers? I think it has to come between customers and the regulator, regulatory body. I mean, customers vote with their money. I mean, that, that's very clear. You know, money money is moving this industry. And regulatory bodies, you know, often, you know, in the case of the US not being states, right, you know, they are interested in, in generating revenues from betting. 
So if the customers vote with their pocket and not betting anymore, you know, the regulators, I'm sure, will we'll find some ways to make it more interesting for them to bet. Right, so now we've got one from at NeilMac555. With the betting landscape ever-changing, do you ever envision Pinnacle allowing customers to request bets through social media as they do with Skybet, Paddy Power, competitors listed, Will Hill? Um, it's it's a common theme, I guess, in the betting industry. Is that something that that Pinnacle has an appetite to from a from a trading perspective? Not really, to be honest. I mean, it's a nice feature. I like it. I mean, I think it's a, you know this entire you know create your own bet, build your own bet, however you want to call it, request a bet. It's it's nice. You know, it's an interesting thing. It's very labor intensive. Um, it's also the stakes we are talking about are very small in the Pinnacle scale. You know, it's really not that interesting for me to create a market for for somebody to bet fifty quid. You know, and if somebody wants to bet fifty thousand quid, I probably don't want to create the market for him because he probably did his research, and I now have around fifty minutes to create a market, and certainly will not be able to price it as effectively. So it, it's it's like you're stuck between a rock and a hard place here yeah, as Pinnacle. Yeah, it seems to circle back to the the same issue, doesn't it? The the square customer or whatever you want to call it, they they can ask for these things or they want these things and providing you can do that en masse, it, it might well might well be beneficial for your business. But as you're saying, someone like Pinnacle, it just, unfortunately, it doesn't work. No, I mean, I would get swamped with smart money trying to create my props, right? All day long, you know, and, and, and the more exotic, the better because they have done their research, you know, but I don't, you know, it's not ending well for me. So another one from the, the world of content and social media, uh, my bag, I think. But what does what does he think of current landscape of sports betting content in the industry, and what could make it better? Current content, I think there's there's, there's surprisingly little content. I mean, I mean, I know I'm, I'm sounding like I'm tooting the own horn here, but I think that the pinnacle betting resources are quite spectacular. I also have been in contact with many, many people who actually ask me, why are you even doing this? I mean, why are you giving out this information? And why are you making it good information? And I think it's an interesting approach, right? Why are we not afraid of giving proper information out you know, without a marketing pitch and every, everything, without bullshit, without touting our own product? I think it's because we're confident and uh, most people won't do it. The betting world doesn't have a great community. You know, the poker world, for example, has. You know, the, even the financial world in some ways has better communities than the betting world. Betting is, is just something that people don't really like to discuss very much in the open. Um, I know there's, you know, lots of Slack, Discord channels where people actively discuss betting, but in the open, it's not a, it's not a big discussion point. And is that, obviously, you don't have an issue with that kind of material being out there from a, a pinnacle perspective. Is that is that beneficial for Pinnacle for, for customers to get sharper and to, to learn more about betting? It's a little bit of both. I mean, the idea is, is is obviously we want to tell people or give people the tools to understand betting at a higher level and, and thus it, understand that yeah, if you are allowed to bet a recreational bookmaker, you're probably not getting the value that you think you are. And you're probably not doing things as right as you think you are. You know, you, you would be better off doing a little bit of homework and betting at a bookmaker who cost, uh, who has a, a more effective margin, and so you pay less money per wager, and thus increase your return over the year. It's it's quite significant the difference between betting and, and into a market that's one percent higher every year. Right. So now we've got a, a very generic question from Betty Gala. What is the future of sports betting? Well, I mean, we've seen live, right? We've seen mobile. I mean, the question is, can AR or VR make an impact in life? If it can make an impact in life, it will make an impact in sports betting. That's unhelpful to me. You know, if something gets adopted on a, at a wider scale, sports betting will just jump on top of it. Both technologies are made for sports betting. You know, so many cool applications for sports betting for both VR and AR. You know, so, you know, but as we all know, there's, you know, nobody's running around with Google Glasses at this moment. You know, we have come, we have come to smart watches, you know, but well, that's where we stopped right now when it comes to smart wearables. What's, what's the next step? I don't know, but I think these two technologies could be huge for the sports betting world in the, in the future. Well, I think one of the, one of the questions earlier, I don't know what word it used, challenge or threat or something like that. Is there, is there anything to you that thinks maybe the way technology is going and how it enhances the the entertainment element of watching sport and how we we can say square betters recreate that they're, they're entertainment betters at the end of the day so is it 
is there potential there for for technology to kind of surpass or, or be misaligned with the pinnacle model in terms of the, the oh, types no, of customers? No, no, quite the opposite. I mean, I, I love the idea. I mean, you know, imagine a Google Glass and you go to a stadium and the way just pop out in front of you, right? You see the free kick right as it happens on the pitch and on the right side, you get a market for it. You know, just on the fly market being created for the situation right in front of you. And if you want to go one second further, now imagine you, you, you go from AR to VR. Now you can zoom out and look at the same market from a different angle. Oh, my God. I mean, isn't that sexy and sweet? You know, I, th I think as an entertainment value, you know, you could pause it. You could pause a shot in front of you. You can, you can watch an NBA game. Somebody takes a lift at the three-point line, has a release, and now you freeze Freeze it, right? And you have no way of going forward or backward. The market only exists for three, four seconds. Make a snap call, in and out, you know, bam. And I think these are cool and fun markets to, to you know, to, to, to bet on. Just on the kind of the, the future of sports betting, a lot of the, apart from one about the esports odds, I think it was, everything is, is geared towards traditional sports in this this podcast. I mean, that might be reflective of the, the audience that we have listening to the Pinnacle podcast. But if there's... There's kind of doubters out there, or, or people that have a don't really understand about esports or what it can offer. Could you maybe just explain why it is so big and, and why the potential is is so big in that specific kind of area of the industry? Yeah, haters gonna hate, 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 right? Um, <laughs> you know, like esports is just here to stay at this stage. Esports is bigger than than most sports at this stage in terms of price money. Esports is quite phenomenal. You know, if you're an esports hater, you're an esports hater. I mean. My head trader, you know, categorically does not want to watch esports. He will watch curling. He will watch this, every other sport, but not esports. He's drawn a line in the sand. That's that's his prerogative. I'm not trying to convince him any other way. It's just you know, it, it's an entertainment uh, that exists. It's an entertainment that's beloved by millions of people. The market is ever growing. Esports is exploding. You know, I, I just think it's something you have to discover for yourself. Either you like it or not. I mean, I remember as a teenager watching chess matches on TV, you know, with commentary. It's probably not for everybody, but I loved it. I thought it was interesting listening to the commentators commenting on chess. Right, we've got one final question, a nice one to end on. It's from our at DEC and, and all the numbers after his name. What would you be doing if you left Pinnacle? I actually thought quite a lot about that. I don't, I don't know. I, I, I quite like building interesting stuff. I probably would be working in the esports industry. I, I do like the esports industry. I think there's a bright future to be had. You know, there's a lot of potential in, in building interesting stuff, tools for the customers. You know, I think esports, how it is right now, and esports how it's going to be in five years, it's going to vastly change, vastly change. And we see it already. I mean, if the last international, you had 3D holograms, projected into the arena of, of characters. Yeah, yeah, it's quite cool. I mean, we've seen it. You've seen 3D holograms, right? Or maybe on a Vegas show, concert, you know, Elvis Presley, Michael Jackson. In Korea, you see it a lot, you know, K-pop, right? K-pop stuff. But here you see it in eSports, right? You see the characters that they select on stage displayed, animated. And that's just cool. Uh, yeah. Right, that is that's all our questions. Uh, I don't think there's many trading directors out there who would who'd come on a company podcast. So thanks a lot, Marco. Much appreciated. That was fun. You know, the people were were, were gentle this time. Well, we'll have to. We could do part three. We'll do next time. A reminder to everyone listening that if you do want to learn more about betting, then head to the betting resources section of the Pinnacle website, as uh, as advertised by our trading director. We've also got plenty of educational videos on the Pinnacle YouTube channel. Thanks for listening and bye for now.